Hey, I'm James from Smoking Dad Barbecue, and this is my take on the Christmas Beef Wellington that solves for a couple of the issues in the most popular Beef Wellington recipes. So a couple years ago, I shared what I think is my best tenderloin. Now, my bias here is I don't love tenderloin. I would take a flat iron steak, a ribeye, a picanha, or anything almost on the beef list ahead of tenderloin. But a couple years ago, I think I finally cracked it, and there was a couple things that I did differently. One, ditch the smoke and go for aromatic smoke bombs. So that's using fresh herbs in our fire. The other thing that I did is a custom beef tallow injection. And this year I am back at it with a couple extra tweaks, including truffles as well as chestnuts. I'm really gonna amp up the Christmas flavors inside of our beef tallow injection. And for bourbon, one of the things that I like in the Joshua Wiseman recipe is he adds bourbon into the duck sale, but I just found this gets a little bit too soggy. But none of those recipes that I follow, whether it's Joshua Wiseman or Gordon Ramsay, are using something like what we have behind us a Kamado Joe and we can get away with a couple other things. So I'm still going to incorporate bourbon. We're going to do it a lot more special that we're going to use bourbon as our flambe sear and a couple other tricks up our sleeve to turn out what I think is the ultimate Christmas tenderloin. So without further ado, let me take you back to yesterday. We're going to start our overnight dry brine and when you rejoin me present day, we'll get working on our ultimate Christmas beef tenderloin. Okay, to get started on our special holiday themed tallow, I'm gonna start with about two pounds of suet or ground beef fat. So next I have an entire head of garlic. I've just removed the papers as well as a couple crushed chestnuts, add those in for nutty savory flavors. For our umami, I'm going to add a package of dried truffles. Next about half a bunch of thyme. Two cups of water. I've got four here just in case I need more, but half of this, which it looks like I'm gonna end up using just so I cover all of our tallow. And I'm going to bring this up to a light simmer, put on our top so it just steams along. And in about two hours, all that water will have evaporated and we'll be left with some perfect holiday flavored beef tallow. Okay, it's been about two hours and all the water has evaporated from our tallow. It'd be really easy when you're looking at it, the water and the fats don't mix. So when they're both water and fat in there, you can see some separation. Once everything looks nice and uniform, just like this, and we've got that cooked chunks of beef from our tallow uh, as everything that's left over along with our flavor ingredients, it's time to strain it off. If you have cheesecloth, that works great. I have a couple sheets of paper towel and a mesh strainer. I'm just gonna put this into a measuring glass with a nozzle on the end, which will make it easier to pour our tallow later. Okay, that looks like everything that I'm gonna get through the paper towel. Got a mason jar as well as just a thin glass. The thin glass will be easier to get our meat injector uh, and I don't want to have raw meat go into the glass. I plan to keep the remaining tallow. It'll hold in the refrigerator for about 30 days. So I wanna separate what I plan to save versus what we're going to use in today's recipe. Perfect. In about an hour or so, that'll be nice white tallow or in these temperatures, maybe even faster. Okay, let's get our Big Joe series one clean and ready. Shake out our ash from our previous cook. Give that a quick wipe. Dump our ash, drop our can back in, charcoal. Add a little bit more fogo, divide and conquer rack. A grate to support our soapstone on the bottom level. Soapstone, grab our grow blazer grow gun, fire it up. I'm gonna try and concentrate the fire towards the back since that's where I wanna get a bunch of heat into our soapstone for a quick sear. I'm out of gas. Be right back. More power. That's more like it. Bottom vents all the way open, and the top vents all the way open. Okay, our center cut of tenderloin looks amazing from the overnight dry brine, getting that nice deep red color. So this is where we're gonna start to go for a couple of things I really like in a beef wellington. So a little bit more truff hot sauce to get that mushroom umami binder. So this will also help our rub stick, but it's gonna add just an extra depth of flavor. We really like that. You don't need much. It's expensive, so you want to tread lightly here, but we're just going to use a little bit as a smear on all sides. Perfect. A little bit of garlic powder. Crack some fresh cracked black pepper. Should be plenty. Sprinkle that on all sides. 
get our meat injector. I did have to go back and warm up the tallow. It started to freeze while we were waiting here, but I'm using, I, I mentioned my previous uh, injector broke when I was doing my Thanksgiving turkey with stuffing. I've ordered and I'm gonna give a try to the spit jack. I've not used this before. It's significantly more expensive than the one I had on Amazon, but it comes with one of these nozzles which has multiple holes all the way through, which I'm hoping just makes getting a nice even layer of our tallow through things a little bit more even. I'll let you know, today's the first test. I can feel the tenderloin puffing up to there it starts to come out. So, so far, that actually worked pretty well. Let's go to the other end. This feels like it's doubled in size. It hasn't, but that, so far, so good. Let's go see if we're ready to get this on for our quick sear. Okay, we are good and hot, ready for our sear. So, seeing about surface temperatures of 740 degrees, that is plenty hot. You want to be over 650. This is getting almost a touch too hot, but it's going to be fine. We're going to move nice and quick. So I want to have everything ready. So what I'm going to do, hopefully you can see on camera, is get our whiskey ready in a shot glass. You don't want to use a bottle when pouring. You're going to be surprised the first time that you do this, the amount of flames that you get. And if you're holding the whole bottle, the, the risk is that you dump that and cause a really big fire. So we're going to have that off to the side. I've got high heat gloves and tongs and everything else that I need. Forgot to mention, I also have uh, two tablespoons of horseradish and whole grain mustard that we're going to brush on immediately after, as well as a resting tray over here. Toss on our tenderloin, switch to high heat gloves and roll. Roll again, sear the ends. Okay, now for the fun part, the flambe. So sometimes people ask between sear sauce and flambeing. Flambeing with a nice bourbon or whiskey imparts a nutty flavor, which is gonna go great with what we're trying to build today. So that's why we're using a little bit of whiskey. So we're just gonna pour a little bit over and stand back. Awesome. Oh, that smells so good. So let's work our way around, repeat, pour a little bit over, keep going, last pour. And that's all we need to get the flavor set we're after. Let's get this over the pan. Start to shut down our dials. We're gonna to wanna to cool this off. And right away, we're gonna to start to brush this with our mustard and horseradish mix. So that as the meat is cooling, it will absorb some of the spice and flavor. So at this point, you might be wondering, James, our grill is over 700 degrees. How are we gonna cool it down for the lower and slower portion? So one of the tips included in my brand new ebook on fire management in all commodities series, series one, two, three, classic, Big Joe, as well as Joe Jr. I have daisy wheel and control tower tops, as well as frequently asked questions and some tips. And one of those tips I'll share today for free, which is how to cool down a very hot grill so we can get back to lower and slower temperatures for the second part of our cook without having to wait hours for our energy efficient Kamado to cool down. Let's come nice and close. I'll show you what to do. So we are still reading nearly 700 degrees on our dome. So for this trick, you're gonna open up a fresh bag of charcoal. We're just gonna dump that in, cover up what we can see, rake that fresh coal over everything to the back and close things up with our vents still set for a lower temperature than what we want, about 270 degrees. Okay, let's get to work on our duck sail while the Joe is cooling down. I already removed the uh, stems from our 700 grams of mushrooms. You just pop them off with your hand, that's really easy. Let's drop these into our food processor. Make some room by giving that a quick blend. Got about five cloves of garlic that I've just sliced up. Some smoked sea salt, fresh cracked black pepper. Sticking more Gordon Ramsay on this recipe. I don't know if you've tried both. Uh, Joshua Wiseman has a, a very popular one as well. He adds some bourbon into his paste mixture and I find that that just uh, comes out in the breading getting a little bit more wet, which we're trying to avoid. So we get sort of a nice crispy puff pastry. Also sticking Gordon Ramsay here with a couple cooked chestnuts for that holiday flavor. Take it fast forward a couple times while I work that around till we've got everything fully incorporated. Speaking of Joshua Wiseman, he does have a tip in there, uh, which is these mushrooms were room temperature before getting started. 
Okay, I've been preheating our pan, so we're about 160 degrees, so it's, it's a warm pan. Let's work this in so we can start to get the moisture out of our paste. All right, our duct cell has stopped bubbling. I'm not seeing any more signs of there being too much moisture, so let's turn off our heat. We're gonna let this cool spread out on a pan. Take you fast forward. Looks good. So this is where I like to make one of those little adjustments, an off-ramp, if you will, off the highway of Gordon Ramsay. In his recipe at this point, now that we have our duck sale ready, we will move into wrapping with prosciutto, adding our filling and getting ready to cook this as a complete unit. But as this is still very much a rare piece of beef that now also has the added benefit of tallow being injected. And what I'm going for with the tallow with any injection, uh, this is kind of a gross analogy, but imagine a snail, how it goes by and it leaves a little bit of trail. As the muscles tighten, they're gonna squeeze out most of what we injected, but leaving behind just a little bit that's gonna add the flavors as well as the lubrication that makes things taste even more juicy and flavorful. So if we wrap this with a pastry like I've done following either Josh or Gordon's recipes, I find the bottom of our pastry gets a little bit soggy because everything that renders out of this cut of beef along with the horseradish and the mustard that we've added, even though we've done our best to remove as much moisture as we can from our mushroom paste, it still ends up a little bit soggy. So my off-road here is to do a little bit more pre cooking of our tenderloin. We're not gonna take it all the way as we do need the pastry to get nice and crispy, but we're gonna take it up to about 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's gonna help squeeze out some of that extra moisture, leave it still plenty rare. So for that last 20 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on your preferences or your family's preferred doneness, that'd be more than enough to finish our pastry, as well as hopefully get a more crispy result than following those uh, very popular recipes. So to pull this off, you know I'm a big fan of the meter block, and if you saw my review of the meter two plus, there are so many great features, save for two sort of wishes. One is more probes in the block, and the real one is Wi-Fi. But I'm gonna use the meter two today because it has additional sensors. So we have five sensors along with our ambient sensor, which is going to help make sure that we don't overcook our roast. This type of steak is where the previous meter probe or any probe that is using one center often gets things wrong. So if you were to insert this sort of dead center, which is what I often would do, the sensor might be sort of about a half inch up from the tip and we're waiting for the concentric heat to reach all the way down into the middle. So by the time you see your preferred temperature, like, okay, great, 114, that's when I normally would pull my steaks, you'll notice it continues to escalate way more than the five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit that we are used to seeing. So by having the extra sensors, I'm gonna get a better read. And I'm also, if you don't have one of these, go vertically as we'll get a better read on what's actually going on than you will going for the end. So let's insert our meter probe here. Perfect. Now we can go get this on. So I don't know if you can see, but we have cooled with our charcoal trick down to about 350 degrees. That's still a little bit warmer than what we want, but no longer nuclear in the amount of time that it took to prepare everything. Let's add an extra cooking grid. For the Gordon Ramsay fans, you'll notice I didn't add any time into our duck cell, and that's because I plan to add it right now, which is our smoke. This is, by the way, my favorite. If you're not following along with a Wellington, a couple years back I shared this recipe with a similar injection. It didn't have the, the truffles and a couple other good bits that we added, but going for a fresh herb smoke versus any wood on something like tenderloin turns out an absolutely awesome result. So where I see a couple glowing coals, I'm just gonna add what I have left from our thyme as well as our tenderloin. So it could help give it some fresh aromatic smoke as well as dry out everything else uh, that's on the outside as well as some of those juices on the inside so that we get a better pastry result. Rejoin you in a little bit when that hits 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So I've tossed our tenderloin in the fridge or actually in the freezer just to help stop any of that carryover cooking. We're at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. If I was to let it sit out here, even these 
very cold temperatures, we would continue to see an appreciation in temperature anywhere to that five to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which is gonna get us in the danger zone when we add our puff pastry of overcooking our tenderloin. So we're gonna shock it, stop it from cooking. It's also gonna give us time to switch our setup. So let me give you a couple options here. If you don't have a dojo or anything like that, you could just go for a defector plate and bring our temperatures up to about 400 to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. If you do have a dojo though, I've tested this with an aeronometer and measured a 4X improvement in airflow versus something like the slow roller, which is supposed to move air 20 times more inside of our Kamado Joe. If you don't have one and you have a grid raiser, raising it up to the top level and going for indirect or double indirect is going to help get you the same benefit. But since I have one though, and I know that it moves air uh, four times better, that's what I'm gonna go with for uh, my setup today. Let me bring you nice and close. We'll switch our setup, which will also allow to make sure any of those fat drippings or anything from before burns nice and clean so we're not getting any bad smoke inside of our puff pastry. So when we go to finish our cook, we're gonna get nice flaky pastry and no off-putting charcoal or beef drippings or anything like that that is going to trip the smoke radar for your most sensitive guests. Drop in our dojo, which will clear everything. Even the divide and conquer rack is no problem. I'm adding in, this is optional, but I'm adding in the grates back on top, just so that we're not getting all of the conduction heat transfer from the pizza stone as that starts to build up heat that will be tempted to overdo the bottom of our pastry. So there's just a small air gap, only about a half inch or so, but that's gonna be more than enough. So let's close our dome, close our top vents, and we'll open our bottom vent and start to wait till we come back up to about 400 degrees Fahrenheit and we adjust that back down. We should be somewhere in the one finger range, but let's let that build heat. While our tenderloin's in the freezer for a few minutes, let's get to work on our prosciutto and duck so wrap. Okay, add in our tenderloin, put that back into the freezer for a few minutes. So next we can get our pastry ready. And as you can see behind me, I've got old smoky. So clearly I've done a couple too many low and slow smokes on my Big Joe series one without doing a higher heat cook like pizza, steak, or a clean burn, but that's okay. We've got a couple minutes for this whole process to get ready. And by the time that we're done, my hope is all that'll be burnt off. That's exactly why we started it when we did so that we didn't get our puff pastry on there and then start to get those fats or oils or whatever it is, is ailing our Kamado Big Joe Series 1 to put out Smokey the Bear warnings. So this has been uh, at room temperature inside. <laughs> it's clearly not room temperature out here for the past three hours. So it should be a little bit more pliable as I'm struggling with my dexterity in the cold today. All right, not gonna lie. At this point, I am pretty bummed out. We don't have the right pastry. Took a run to a store I could find that was open and all that they have at this late stage in the game, because maybe everyone else is making the same thing, is pie crusts, which do not give us the right amount of puff pastry to cover our Wellington. But we got a lot of money tied up in our beef Wellington at this point. It's not gonna look the way that it should. Uh, so just don't follow along with the wrong puff pastry. But if it was the proper stuff, we would not be having these issues. Say la vie. So outside of looking really bad from all the seams of trying to get two nine inch small pie crusts to cover this, I'm hoping it still tastes the same. So let's continue as if it was proper and give it a quick little egg wash. Had this not been such an embarrassment, I was going to show how you don't need one of those fancy rollers, just like what Gordon Ramsay does in his video and just use the back of our knife to create a bit of a pattern in here. But at this point, wheels are firmly off the cart. It's flaky sea salt on top. Okay, so we're running right around 425, nearly 430 degrees Fahrenheit. Drop in our little abomination to an otherwise good recipe. Let that cook. Okay, the meter says it's time to remove our roast. Let it rest. Well, let's get a slice, see how we did. Cheers. Mm. I might have just saved Christmas. This 
looks terrible. Like, I could not have more things go wrong, but it came together in terms of how it tastes. So the highlights of today's recipe, definitely the tallow injection. This has more flavor than any tenderloin I've ever done. Sticking with our herb smoke bombs, this is absolutely perfect. Our duck cell tastes amazing. That bourbon sear, wow, like this part is all amazing. Recommend to your friends, your family, anybody you know, that part of today's recipe is great. Clearly getting the wrong pastry from the grocery store the first time and then trying a last minute right before Christmas uh, to pick up the proper puff pastry, that did not go well at all. And so our visual score, I'm gonna give this a zero. Our flavor though, I'm gonna give this for tenderloin. Like this is as good as it gets. This is the best tenderloin I've ever made and ever had. Like this is so full of flavor. I wish I could explain in a better way how tasty the tenderloin and the duck cell component is apart from the pastry and the visual appeal. That's it for today though. I hope you pick something out of it, including what to do and what not to do if you uh, tackle the Christmas Wellington this holiday season. That's it for today. I'm James from Smoking Net Barbecue, signing off. Seriously, the tenderloin, really good. Mm.